نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله واصحابه ومن سار على نهجه ومستند بسنته الى يوم الدين اما بعد فاتقوا الله ايها الاحباب فقد امرنا سبحانه وتعالى في تنزيله يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون ثم اما بعد my brothers and sisters uh, on this blessed day of this blessed hour of يوم الجمعة we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to accept from us our good deeds and our efforts Allahumma amin and we further ask Allah Azza wa Jal to forgive us of our shortcomings and our mistakes Allahumma amin ayyuha al-ahbab we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to indeed ease the pain and suffering of our brothers and sisters aina ma kan wherever they may be Allahumma amin I want to share with you actually two stories. Uh, a few days ago, I had a sister walked into the office and said that she was going through turmoil uh, with her marriage. She said she had gotten married about two years ago and uh, she didn't actually want to marry the guy. And she wasn't forced, but the way that she described it is that she was pressured that this was the right guy for her. And so, and just so that we're all on the same page, she describes that when this, this guy came in the picture, everybody in the family was saying, you know, it's a good guy, he's in his dean, he's got a good job, etc., etc. He's the right guy for you. So the pressure came from all corners, from family, from relatives and cousins and friends and so on. So with all that pressure, she just kind of said to herself, well, if everybody wants me to do it, then it might be a good thing. So whatever, I'll just go ahead and do it. And she did further described that even on her wedding day, she was trying to tell her family, you know, I don't love this guy, but you all keep telling me he's the right person. So I mar I'm going to marry him. But I just want to be clear, this is not what I want. And they, they, they kind of said things to her like, oh, don't worry about it. That's just, you, you know, you're getting cold feet. You're, being, you're getting nervous. Once you get married, things settle down. Everything is going to work out and it'll be fine. Boy, were they wrong. It actually became the complete opposite. She said that for this two years, she never touched her husband. They lived in the same house. So just to give you an idea, just what life was like in the home. And all this time, the husband, you know, he was trying to do a lot of things to kind of make the relationship work so that somehow she could warm up to him. And it never happened. And as a result, this sister went into severe depression as a result. You know, what was supposed to be, you know, a place of ease and comfort, you know, her home became like this prison and she felt very trapped for all these years and she kept repeating it to her husband and everyone else I didn't want this but this was the pressure on me finally after these two years the husband said to her and I thought that this was fair to some extent he said to her look you didn't get a chance to make a decision when we got married well, this decision now is yours. Decide where you want to go from here. And if this is the end, by all means, I will re respect that and let it happen. That's where the husband left the home. They're separated but not divorced. And now she's, she's come to the office because she's lost. You want to hear the dilemma of all of this? The irony in all of this? I asked her, well, what do you want to do? Because it sounds to me that this is also a, an ideal situation. No children, okay? The, the marriage is there, but you've never really had a marriage with him. So inshallah ta'ala, you know, it's a good opportunity. He's cooperating. The marriage can split. You can move on. He moves on. And who knows what happens afterwards? She says to me, I'm not really sure I want to leave him. And she said that how um, in her culture, which I won't mention what culture that is, 
in her culture and where she comes from, uh, these kinds of marriages are encouraged, that even if you don't love the person, as long as you can get security and he or she can provide, or they're good people, you marry them anyway. So she's thinking along those lines. And I said to her, if you make a decision based on what you've just said, you will be back not only in this office, but someone else's office as well. Because you're missing the main ingredient. And this main ingredient of a successful relationship is not from me or anyone else. This is from Allah Himself. He is the one, subhanahu wa ta'ala, that says there has to be mawadda and rahmah in a relationship. And if you don't have this love and mercy for each other, it's never going to happen. Money doesn't keep a relationship together. You know, security doesn't do those things. That's a big and important part of the picture, but that's not the purpose why this happens. And subhanAllah, you know, it kind of went back and forth like this to the point now where I thought for a minute the way things were going, we were going to get some direction towards some kind of solution. And it ended off where, you know, this poor sister was lost and confused and started crying and she just didn't know what to do. And she said, I just came out of depression. I was hospitalized. I'm on medication. And now I just, I'm lost again. I'll come back another time. Taught me something. And it reminded me of something that I want to share with you today. And I think that this is important for each and every one of you, regardless of your status or your background, regardless of how much Islam you know or don't know. Every single one of us will come to a point, if you haven't already been there, where you hit a dead end and you don't know what decision to make in that particular circumstance. You don't know who to turn to. You're lost for words, you, have, you don't have the answers. And you go to the people that are closest to you, the people that you trust, and they can't help you either. Very often I meet parents who talk to me about their children, and they'll say to me that their kids, you know, are good kids, but there's always that one. I don't know how to communicate with him or her. They don't listen to no advice. They don't have no respect for parents. What do I do? I thought I, my tarbiya, I thought my training for these kids was going well until I had this one. And I don't have any answers for him. And then even on an individual level, each of us have a story. And it's a story no one knows except you and Allah Azza wa Jal. Your family probably doesn't know the pain in your story. That something you've experienced or you're probably going through right now. And it's so painful that you try to do what many do. You cover it up or you don't talk about it. And you put on the artificial image that you smile and you go on each and every day. But you never go to bed unless this pain strikes you. You, your mind constantly works and you're always thinking about that one thing or that moment that has really put so much pain in you, you don't know how to cope with it. Ayu al ahbab, my khutbah for you today in the short time that we have with one another is to perhaps remind you of how the Quran gives us a way out and gives us a way out regardless of your status and your knowledge, regardless of how much you devote and practice your deen, this message is for you. If you think for a moment how all prophets and messengers dealt with hardship, pain, and struggle at all levels, you had some prophets that even their own children they couldn't guide, Nuh alayhi salam, his own son, he couldn't advise him and tell him to do the right thing. And it pained him so much so that he told Allah Azza wa Jal in Surah Hud, Innahu min ahli, he's my son, he's from my family. You know, have some mercy on him. Try to help me through this because that's my child. What does Allah Azza wa Jal say? Innahu laysa min ahlik. Subhanallah. Allah stamps it and makes it firm. When it comes to this, yeah, maybe the relationship, the bloodlines are there. But when it comes to obedience, no, he's not your family. 
He didn't do what he was supposed to do, obeying a prophet who also obeys his creator. So there was that struggle. Then it's sometimes the tables are turned. Sometimes you have the children. Sometimes you have the community. Sometimes you have the followers. Prophets and messengers really struggled. They all hit a dead end at some point. Maryam alayhi salam. You know, here's this man who comes in the form of a man, but we all know Jibreel alayhi salam. Comes to her to give her some news. You know, you're going to have a child. What's the first thing she does? She says, قَالَتْ إِنِّي أَعُوذُ بِالرَّحْمَنِ مِنْكْ إِنْ كُنْتَ تَقِيَّةً she says to Allah Azza wa Jal, protect me from him, Ar-Rahman. So what happens? The first thing when she gets cornered and she reaches a point where she doesn't know how to respond and it's obvious she's never been with anyone, so how could she get pregnant? She tells this man, may Allah protect me from you. If you have any fear, if you have any conscience in you, get away from me. The man, Jibreel alayhi salam, tries to plead his case. Qala innama ana rasulu rabbik. He tries to tell her, hey, hey, wait, wait a minute. I'm a messenger. I was sent to kind of give you this news. I didn't just make it up. And it still went back and forth. Here's the secret. If you do this, if you have this one secret and you hold on to it, there will never be a dead end or a corner you fall into, except insha'Allah, you will find a way out. And you will do, do so peacefully. And you will do so with confidence. You'll feel good about yourself. You'll start to feel good about all those around you. And the next time you hit another dead end, you're cornered again. Because this is the sunnah of life. This is why the Prophet ﷺ told us, dunya mal'una. You know, this world is cursed. It's his way of saying, nothing ever goes the way you, you're, you plan it to go in this worldly life. No matter what plan you put together, that you want to achieve a certain result, there's no guarantee it will happen that way. That's why it's so tough to live here. So you plan a marriage to live happily ever after. You weren't thinking or wondering maybe after a year or two, here you are, you're starting from scratch again. You hope to have a family. You hope to have happiness. You hope to raise good children that love their deen, only to find out that Allah has tested you because one of your kids say, Dad, Mom, I don't want to be Muslim no more. And so you're stuck. So what do you do? This one secret. And it is the secret of all prophets and messengers. Ayyu al ahbab they all turned back to Allah. And they talked to Him. They pleaded to him. You know, I want to share with you another story. Years ago, I was in Europe. And I did a seminar. And there was a brother sitting there. He was bald. And he, he didn't have no hair. He shaved himself bald. And then he tattooed designs all over his body. I mean, he looked very intimidating to me. But he had a book in his hand. And he was following along the lesson. When we had a break, this brother came to the desk where I was and asked me to turn off the microphone. I said, okay. He said, I was incarcerated for years and just recently I was released, I was free. And I have done every crime a human being can imagine. It's either I've done it or I was involved in it. These are his exact words. But he said to me when he was in prison, he accepted Islam. And he started to pray and he really changed his life and he changed his attitude. He connected with Islam. And he said the reason how he connected so well and this deen resonated with him is that every movement, every footstep about Islam is always connected to Allah. You never say or do anything on your own. You're, you're very careful of how you talk. We're even told in Quran, the tone of voice you use, even when you're saying the right thing, has to be under control. Every footstep you take, how you conduct yourself, everything else is connected to Allah. He said that resonated with him. He needed that. 
Then after he said all of this, this is where it really became shocking. And it became even life-changing for me. This brother, he looked like he was about 300 pounds. He started wailing and crying at the desk. And he dropped his head to the floor and he cried and he cried and he cried. He cried so much, well, I thought he was going to faint. So I got up and I kind of held him a little. I said, brother, you okay? I said, just talk to me, talk to me. He said, I don't deserve to have this second chance. I have done so much wrong in my life. I don't deserve this. And then he looks at me and he says, you know what adds to all of my pain? He said, somebody actually wants to get to know me with the intention of marriage, a sister. She wants to get to know me with the intention of getting married. And she's never committed a crime in her life. She's never been with anyone else in her life. She's innocent. And he described her, she's focused, she's religious. And as a matter of fact, that sister paid his fee to enter into this class, which happened to be the first Islamic class he's ever sat in in his life. And the sister was sitting in the class as well. And he said, I don't deserve this. And I don't know what to do. Every time something good comes along, this is how I feel and I shut it down. But I don't want to do it this time. I didn't know what to say. I don't know what any of you would say to someone like this. So the first thing that came to mind is I said this to him. I said, look, when the seminar is over, on your way home, do you pass by a masjid? He said, yeah. I said, drive in and get to a masjid. And even if it's not salah time. And I said, go inside and pray two rak'ats. And in those two rak'ats, talk to Allah and tell him what you just told me. And after when the salah is done, raise your hands and cry the way you just cried to me. Cry even more to him. And I said, that's all. Here's my email. Tell me how it goes. Literally in five minutes, I just said to myself, I have no way of counseling this. I don't know what to say, but I'm always safe if I try to get this person back on the lane so that they're connected with their creator. They need to establish and keep that connection. Let me tell you, it's been a couple of years. I recently got an email from the same brother. And his email, it was really nice. It started off in Arabic, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Then he explained that he did what I told him to do. And then he met some good brothers in the masjid. They saw him crying. They came and asked him, are you okay? Is there anything we can do? He explained to them and said the same thing. Some of those brothers invited them, him to their house. He went and he had dinner. He talked, he opened, and he said to them, this is my situation. Those brothers supported him and helped him. And alhamdulillah, it is just by Allah's mercy and permission. That brother has three children with the same sister. When you turn to Allah... And you talk to him when you hit a dead end. That's the result. It's the result that no human being can provide for you. It's the result no advice can give you. That's what prophets learned. And that's what they did. And you know, the flip side of all of this, we live in a time now where Muslims, generally speaking, can count the amount of times they spoke to Allah in a whole day or a week. Because it's so seldom. It's so seldom, they're not accustomed to doing this anymore. And if the imam is making the dua, when is he going to finish? You know, it's, 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 more, it's been more than three minutes. This is, that's, what we've, that's our hal, that's our circumstance. That, that's not something across the board. We're talking about a culture that's around us where we want the quickest prayers, we want the fastest salahs, we want the shortest surahs, we want the quickest sajdahs, like all of this stuff. You know, on the one hand, there might be some element of good in it. But on the other hand, especially when you're alone, especially when you can pray by yourself and you have the opportunity 
to really make the sajda as long as you want, to really make the dua in however way and whatever language you want, and still those opportunities are not taking advantage of, the ulama, they teach us and they tell us, that's when the servant of Allah hits the dead end. They hit that brick wall and they don't know where to go. And so panic begins. Spiritual panic, spiritual dilemma begins. Man, if Allah put me to this wall, is this really the truth? Is this really the deen? You know, we're supposed to be the happiest, we're supposed to be the most blessed on earth. Why would Allah put me here? Why would Allah allow this to happen to me? And Allah Azza wa Jal responds to questions like this. Ya ibadi, O oh my slave. Don't lose hope in anyone. Have confidence in people. Trust one another as long as you get sound advice. But don't ever lose trust in me. لا تقنطوا من رحمة الله Don't you ever lose hope in me. So you can trust people to an extent. There's a limit to that trust. But with Allah, He says, don't ever lose the connection. You know, we can sit here and I can tell you, okay, do this, this, and this, and this, and inshallah, that connection is made and you'll never hit that dead end again, etc. You know, there's a lot of things our deen teaches us about this. But because of the short time that we have, I wanted to choose something that I think every single one of us here can relate to. We can all relate to dua, can't we? We all know that connection, don't we? And we know the sunnah way of making dua. Allah said in the Quran, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي Allah said, whenever He asks of me, it doesn't say, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي فِي الْمَسْجِدِ فِي الصَّلَاةِ Allah doesn't say, when He asks about me in the masjid, or in prayer, or in Jum'ah, or in Wudu, Allah says, whenever you ask about me, whenever you call on me, you know what that means? Even if you're just walking from here to your car, you can actually make dua. And there's a good chance your dua will be accepted because it's Jum'ah bi'idhnillah. When you're just driving out of the parking lot and you're just saying, astaghfirullah, and you're turning the wheel, you're just saying, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. One of those astaghfirullahs could be the one that Allah accepts from you, and before you know it, the rest of your time in this world, every mistake you make has forgiveness attached to it. It's guaranteed because of that one you did sincerely for Him. We will never know until we meet Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, where we stand in this world. But Allah says, you got to trust me and make sure you follow what prophets and messengers did before you. Every hardship and struggle and pain and suffering they themselves and their people went through, they all had the exact same formula. Turn back to Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. With that being said, we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to keep us close to Him and connected to Him, whether it be through dua or salah or any or any other form of worship. Ya Rabbi, we ask you to keep us close to you. Oh Allah, only you know the state of my faith and my iman. Oh Allah, accept from me my efforts. I am trying my best. Oh Allah, increase me and forgive me of my shortcomings and my mistakes. Allahumma ameen. Aqulu ma tasma'oon wa astaghfiru Allah li wa likum wa risa'il al-muslimin min kulli dham. Fastaghfiru innahu huwa al-ghafur al-rahim. بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن والاه أما بعد My brothers and sisters, I wish to conclude that as you continue with your day, you continue with your lives, that whatever it is that you choose to do as you walk out of here, just remember that at the end of the day, the one who does not have Allah in his or her life they will always find what they see or what appears to be something wrong or something difficult, it will always become difficult. The hardship will equal a hardship. But the people who are connected to Allah, they see hardship and pain probably as the highest state of Iman they will ever experience in their entire life.
They see those moments as opportunity. Because that's the moment where they don't want to hear from no one else. They don't want no advice or they're not going to talk to no one. They just want to talk to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh Allah, you know why I can't make it. You know why I lost my job. You know why I got a heart attack. You know why I'm sitting on this hospital bed. You know why I'm in the state that I am in. Ya Rabbi, you know the state of my family. You know the state of my community. But I turn to you. Guide me and steer me towards the direction that is pleasing to you, Ya Rabb. You start doing that, there's nothing out there you cannot handle. And that is what makes us, bi'ithnillah, the people of success in this world, wa fil akhirah. Insha'Allah ta'ala. May Allah Azza wa Jal bless us and honor us that we hold on to the message of the Quran and the legacy of our messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And with that being said, we send peace and blessings to him. Salawatu rabbi wa salamuhu alayhi. Kama amarana subhanahu wa ta'ala fi tanzili. Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusallun ala al-nabi. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama salli على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم اغفر المسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء منهم والأموات إنك قريب سميع مجيب الدعوات اللهم إننا نسألك الجنة وما قرب إليها من قول أو عمل ونعوذ بك من النار وما قرب إليها من قول أو عمل ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب